Hello everyone, we would like to welcome you to the Breathitt Lecture in Undergraduate Research. This lecture is actually the end, the formal end of our programming year, and it's so fitting that this year would end with um, the presentation of original research uh, by a student. At the Gaines Center for the Humanities, we've actually made a commitment that we would try to do all of our events so that people could join us both in the physical space where we are and virtually. And we'd like to apologize to those of you who were not able to log on, but we hope that you will enjoy this recording of that program. The Breathitt Lectureship was established to honor former Governor Ned Breathitt, whose interest in higher education and humanities was exceptional. So this lectureship is awarded to an undergraduate whose qualities of mind and spirit have been expressed eloquently on one or more of the basic concerns of the humanities. Our lecturer tonight, from, selected from a highly competitive pool, is fine arts student and Lexington native Matthew Klumper. Matthew is a graduating senior majoring in digital media and design and minoring in media arts and studies. He is a member of the Lewis Honors College and his project tonight began as his senior honors thesis. His work at UK has primarily been photo and video based and last semester he won first place at the annual Carrie Ellis exhibition in the digital media category. Matthew has worked several video production jobs throughout his time at UK and he hopes to pursue work in the field after graduating. His lecture tonight was mentored by fine arts faculty Forrest Kelly and will focus on the retelling of Kentucky urban legends through photography. Please join the Gain Center for the Humanities in welcoming Matthew Klumper. The fact that I've lived in Kentucky uh, basically my whole life is sort of what drove me to this topic and I'll get into that a little bit more uh, later in the presentation. So before we start, I'll just kind of begin with a bit of an agenda of what I'm gonna go over. I will start by taking a look at the sort of methodology of this project. Uh, I'll talk about why I chose the subject matter of urban legends. I will show some uh, conceptual and visual influences that shaped the way I wanted to retell these stories, and then I'll sort of walk you through the techniques that I used to do so. Um, after that, I will show a short video which will visualize the original deliverable that I imagined uh, when I was first thinking of this project. It was a gallery installation, and uh, the process of projecting these images and then projecting illustrations of the subjects of the urban legends over top of them is a technique that sort of guided the other deliverables that I've worked this project into as I used it for this lecture or for the gallery show or for my thesis. Um, after that, we will take a little bit of a deeper look into each of the three urban legends that I cover and I'll explain a little bit more about some of the photos from these uh, series and how I went about organizing them and composing them and capturing them. And then I'll talk a little bit more about turning this into an actual gallery show that'll go up in a couple weeks at the uh, capstone show in the digital media design major. And then I will open it up to questions. So to sort of explain why I chose this. I thought it would be useful to start by showing a bit of my past work. Uh, this is different photography, or different images from various photography assignments uh, in my major. And I enjoyed making them all, and they taught me a lot creatively and technically, but I, for my senior thesis, I wanted to do something that had a, like, a little bit more meaning and was sort of drawing from experiences uh, in my own life in a more significant way that had more of an impact outside of just my own education. And I started to become interested in work related to Kentucky uh, because I've lived here my whole life. So that kind of leads us into uh, my first conceptual influence, which is Tyler Webb. Uh, Tyler Webb uses textiles, mending techniques, and creative practices that are rooted in Kentucky's history to create clothing, home decor, and various other art objects. Um, and I was just, I've, I've been 
interested in his work for several years, and I was just like captivated by how he's able to take processes that are like outdated at this point or old and turn them into engaging works of art and just make working Kentucky into your art cool. And I just, I thought that was really interesting and that was what I was hoping to do in this project a little bit. Uh, my next influence is someone that I feel like I've referenced in so many uh, projects throughout my time in this major. If I ever have to like do a reference slide for a project, uh, Tom Sachs usually is on there. Um, he's sort of, his approach to art influenced how I captured these images, uh, mainly in two specific ways. Uh, he is a sculptor who specializes in bricolage sculpture, and he focuses a lot of his work around the idea of sympathetic magic. So bricolage sculpture is an approach to sculpture which involves using the resources at your disposal rather than going out and sourcing perfect resources and trying to create works that are perfect. He talks about how he, he hates iPhones and he loves that his works aren't a perfect little black box there. You can see the hot glue drips and the screw heads and you can see the process. And that was sort of, that impacted the way I wanted to capture these because um, I, wanted, I wanted viewers to sort of like feel the process of going through these places. Um, and then his idea of sympathetic magic, uh, he describes it as uh, when you build a model of your enemy's fort and burn it down, kind of like a voodoo doll. <laughs> um, so it's kind of just the process of uh, making something real through the process of creation. And that was like a big part of why I wanted to use photography to retell these stories because using photography captures these places and these moments and it freezes them in time in a way that they can't be distorted the same way they would if it was being retold orally. Um, you know, you could like exaggerate the height of the bridge in the tale of the goat man but when you see it in a picture, it makes it more real in a sense, even if I'm leaning into the storytelling in the way that I capture it, which I will talk about now. <laughs> um, so these are a few of my visual influences uh, that Forrest Kelly, my advisor, uh, helped me to like, search out. Uh, Benoit Payet and Matthew Ginatempo. I, I just really like the way that they utilize like darkness and like overexposing or underexposing photos to create like an atmosphere and a sense of mystery, which I thought was really relevant to these stories, which are, they're, they're not true, but uh, if you're in the spaces, they start to feel a little bit more true and they're a little bit creepier. Um, so I was trying to recreate that feeling in these, in my photos, and I was referencing these artists. Um, as I captured them. So, yeah, my techniques to achieve this effect uh, is loosely shown on the screen, but I captured all my images at night just to lean into the mystery and the sort of spooky elements. But also, I wanted to be able to craft the light and really control the narrative. So, I would take multiple long exposures and I would use a flashlight to paint in light in the scene. And then in editing, I would cut them together to create one image. And I liked the look of almost using like a flashlight to explore these places. Again, I wanted to place viewers in the role of somebody who's sort of navigating these spaces and uncovering more. And you almost feel like you're doing so with the flashlight, but I've, using the flashlight works perfect on both ends because it creates that feeling for the audience, but also allows me to control exactly what's being shown as the series goes on, and I can reveal bits of information in each photo. So now I'm gonna show the uh, the video that sort of demonstrates the 
projection installation that I originally planned, which has shaped uh, every other deliverable up to this point. So, oh. okay. Okay, so, all right, 
So that was sort of the uh, original idea that I had, which, which sort of was my first idea of how I could blend these images with illustrations. And it's guided the deliverables afterwards, and we'll get into that after. But first, I want to go into each story in a little bit more depth and sort of walk through the process of capturing certain images and ordering them the way that I did. So the Kentucky Goatman is also called the Popelik Monster. And the legend says that in the area surrounding the Popelik Trestle, just outside of Louisville, an old circus train was going across the bridge. And there are various reasons for why it got derailed. But at one point, it got derailed or stopped. And the goat man escaped out of one of the cars. And now he roams the area. And uh, it sort of explained it in that, uh, the video. But the legend is that if you are in the area and you happen to step up on the tracks up near the bridge, it sort of triggers him. And you'll either one of two things will happen. You'll either start to hear voices on the tracks that, is, that are crying for help, and that's supposed to be the goat man uh, mimicking those voices, or you'll be hypnotized onto the tracks. But either way, the result is that you'll be hit by a train and die, and uh, then the goat man will eat you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's the story, and now I'll kind of walk you through the images. So this fence it ran along the base of the more accessible side of the bridge. There's actually a walking path right by it. And this fence is big and has barbed wire. But it clearly, uh, people are still uh, interested in going up there. And I thought this image sort of captured the, the clear evidence that there are people going to the top. and. Um, yeah, it was just the introduction. There are some images that aren't directly related to the story, but that sort of build the atmosphere, or that was the intent of these images of the uh, location. Uh, so we have like this, this, the, the bridge is enormous, and it's, it's scary in its own way. It's huge and it's old, and there are like fallen railroad spikes on the ground down below, and just other pieces of pretty large fallen equipment that kind of make it its own threat. Um, so that was this image. Uh, this was, I, I don't think it was blood, but it could have been blood. Uh, I went back a couple weeks later, and it was still there, which was kind of concerning. But again, uh, it just sort of leads, leans into the, the fantastical elements if you suspend disbelief when you're looking at these images. and. Um, yeah, it sorts of helps to set this tone. Uh, this was one of the first locations where I thought it could be good to overlay an image. Uh, this looks like a place where you might encounter the goat man before accidentally uh, triggering him up by the tracks. So that's why I chose this one to do the overlay of the image onto. And. This one was just, uh, it's just a train going over the tracks. I was taking pictures of the fence when I realized that a train was going over the tracks. And it took maybe 30 seconds from me realizing a train was coming to the train already crossing the bridge. It just kind of shocked me how quickly it comes. And there are lots of news reports of people dying on the tracks from either getting hit or uh, like getting stuck and you know falling off of them, and uh, I kind of it just it, I underestimated it, and I was hoping this would sort of communicate. <laughs> I never went on the tracks, but <laughs> I did get close. I went up. I was sort of trying to progress from being down below to up top. So this is up uh, near the top, and I chose to include the second overlay up here. This is also up near the top, looking down over the edge of sort of a drop off. And it just thought, yeah, it added to the mood. Another train came by when I was up there taking pictures. And 
I captured this image. And this is the memorial of a girl who fell off of the train tracks a few years ago. And I was, when I was doing research, there are other pictures of this. And it's interesting to see how originally it was just a cross. And then over time, the family seems to have added more and more to it. And it's, it was just like, it's one of the first things you see when you walk up the trail to it. And uh, it just, this is like, it is an actually dangerous place, even if the urban legend might not necessarily be true. Um, yeah, it is still a dangerous place. This story, Pan of Cherokee Park, is a lot more lighthearted. Um, the story is also based near Louisville in Cherokee Park, which is a huge, really beautiful park. Um, but the story is that there is a fountain in a pavilion, and it's called Hogan's Fountain. And at the top is a little statue of the Greek god Pan. And uh, the stories say that at night, he leaps off the statue to cause mischief and damage throughout the park. And it's not as scary. It doesn't necessarily like add to the creepy mood of the stories, but I still thought it would be interesting to tell visually. And it would be a good example of how these images uh, offer a different perspective into the tradition of retelling these legends. So this is the first image, which is uh, one of the, there's, there's tons of paths that wind through the park. And this was just sort of setting the stage as you sort of enter the park um, through these images. Um, here's more images. This is just a fallen tree in the middle of a patch of woods. This image and the next image, I tried to pair to maybe give some spatial connection. Uh, this is a tree that is near the fountain. And here it is looking from the other side towards the fountain. Uh, I tried to like slowly introduce it as if you approached it from a distance, because it's sort of out in the open a little bit. Um, this one, I wanted to try to capture the movement of him possibly jumping off of the fountain uh, using, like, uh, just zooming as I took the longer exposure. Uh, this one doesn't have as much of, like, painting in light with the flashlight, but. There were lots of places throughout the park that it just seems strange that they like were in a park at all. This was an archery range just out in the open, um, but it was already kind of falling apart when I went the first time, and the second time I went, it was even more. It was in even worse shape, um, so I thought it might be a good opportunity to lean into the story and overlay the an image of Pan. Here is a traffic cone that got thrown into the creek, or a stack of them. These are more images that just, it's a big park and it's a nice looking park, but it's also very massive and heavily wooded. So I was just trying to capture the space and I sort of perched him up there. And then here's just a wider shot in there are different, uh, there's not really like an official source for these uh, legends. A lot of them are from like kind of old looking websites that you might have found in like 2005. They look like half of, half of them don't work and they're like difficult to navigate. But there's like different uh, accounts. And one of them was that uh, trying to explain how he could possibly jump off the fountain. And uh, the person noted how the fountain is like a really like white stone and the statue's dark and they were they were kind of playing it up with their writing but they were like perhaps it was a trick of the light perhaps my eyes deceived me could he be gone um <laughs> so but i was i hadn't really thought about that until i read that but yeah this was just sort of to establish the fountain uh, more straight on and then the final story uh the witch's grave is maybe the saddest out of all of them, I think. Uh, it's based uh, in Pilot's Knob Cemetery, just outside of Marion, Kentucky. It's about three and a half hours away. And it really is just a little cemetery in the middle of nowhere. And 
it was, it was the, by far the creepiest location to shoot in. Uh, this is the, the, the gate that surrounds the cemetery. It was just a piece of wire with loose bits of barbed wire, and it was tied across various... This cross is the first thing you see when you drive up. There's a massive gravel road, and uh, it feels pretty intimidating when you enter the space uh, when it's pitch black. This is more of the perimeter and just how... This is sort of the view when you start walking past the gate and into the cemetery. It feels a little bit disorienting because by the time you get to the gravestones, you're far enough away that you can't really see your car in the parking lot and it's very dark. So I don't know, there were a couple times where I thought I was heading in one direction and I wasn't. So I was trying to capture sort of that as I took these images. Again, this is sort of a similar approach to uh, the fountain uh, by like introducing it at a distance before we get closer. The, the little girl's grave was basically at the very back of the cemetery, uh, right along the edge of the woods. And a part of the story that I didn't really mention in the video or that I haven't been like showcasing because I thought it might take away is that there's a separate uh, entity in the cemetery called the Watcher that wants to steal the little girl's soul, but the fence keeps him out and her in. Um, so this kind of adds to that without sort of overcomplicating it for a story about things that you can't see. This is an image from above the headstone looking up at the trees because um, the, the reason behind the fence was that she couldn't climb over it because she was five years old. And uh, yeah, I was trying to sort of capture that aspect of the story with this angle. This is a close-up of her headstone. Uh, I've talked about the inclusion of this little stuffed unicorn. I thought it might take away from the sort of the narrative. Uh, and I was talking with my advisor, Forrest Kelly, and uh, we sort of, it, it does sort of take you out of the moment maybe for a second, but it also kind of shows that there are still people who are engaged with this story and interested in this story. And this girl died over 100 years ago, and I seriously doubt that a family member put this uh, stuffed unicorn there. It was most likely other people who were interested in the story of the witch girl um, from Marion County that showed up and placed this there. And this final image is a, just a bird's eye view of the headstone. I, I just wanted to sort of like provide context for what it looked like, and I got help from Mary Sherman to take this picture. <laughs> um, but the reality of the story is that she was not a witch, and they never actually burned her. She actually died of a disease related to inflammation of her stomach lining. And it's kind of not a great ending or not like a nice resolution in terms of storytelling, but it it kind of illustrates a common theme throughout all of these stories, which these are stories that are made up and distorted and warped as ways to sort of like over-exaggerate unfortunate circumstances in communities. In the Goat Man, there are people who are just curious, often young people who are curious about going onto the bridge and exploring, and they, don't, they underestimate how fast the train is, and they fall. Uh, in the story of Pan and the fountain, that's not as serious, but it's just teenagers and kids vandalizing the park and destroying stuff. And in this case, it was just a girl who unfortunately died at a really young age, and people made up stories about uh, what they believed happened to her. 
So moving forward, after this presentation, I'll be actually installing these images in a gallery for my senior capstone project, our gallery show. And I'm going to try to get actual slides printed of the images so that I can do the projector installation as shown in the video. But I'm also going to be presenting them as prints in a portfolio box. And it's, that's essentially, it's bound like a hardcover book and it's built using the same, cover, like, same type of materials, but the images sit loose in the box. And as you can see in some of these, they can be split up into compartments. So as I was taking the pictures, I was also collecting objects from each location. At the Poplick trestle, I gathered some of the loose uh, railroad spikes and like pieces that had fallen off the bridge. And at the cemetery, there were wildflowers. And I'm going to include the prints as well as Polaroid sort of documentation style photos of those objects that I gathered. And then a map that sort of, sort of along the lines of the one that came before those explanations of the stories as sort of a box divided into three sections that allows viewers to hopefully get the same experience of navigating these spaces as they would in that uh, projection. Before I wrap up, I want to say thank you to the Gaines Center uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak to everyone today. I want to thank my parents for supporting me. I want to thank Mary for coming with me and helping me so much. And I want to thank everybody who came out uh, to listen to me speak today. This was scary, but it was a cool experience. <laughs> 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 to ask some questions of Matthew, and I am going to have to distill your questions a little bit for our recording, so I'm not repeating you just to be annoying. <laughs> it's for the recording later, so yes. I was curious, you said you were painting with your flashlight. Can you demonstrate or explain that? Sorry. Yeah. So uh, the question is, how does one paint with a flashlight for photography? Um, I would... Basically for each image, I would set the camera on a tripod and then set the exposure time to like 15 or 30 seconds so that it would let in more light. Since it was so dark, it didn't like immediately blow out the image and overexpose it. And I could sort of shine the flashlight where I wanted and draw in light in the scene where I wanted it. And that would sort of light up the places that I wanted to light up and leave the other places dark. And that allowed me to highlight certain parts of the scene and sort of tell the story at the pace that I wanted, while also leading into that fact of if you were navigating these spaces with a flashlight, you wouldn't be able to see the entire thing. You'd be slowly navigating it yourself. So it helped viewers to hopefully feel that sense of like slowly uncovering information and it allowed me to slowly give that information. Questions? Were all of your photographs more than one photo? Um, Yes. Not all of them. So sorry, Matthew. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, have to, I hate this part. So the question is whether all of Matthew's photos were a combination of multiple photos, or if any of them were just a single shot photo. Uh, no, not all of them were. Most of them were, and that was sort of, I would like leave with a list about what I wanted to uh, like take pictures of. But there were times where I would like just get one really good take, or for an instance, like when the train would come by, uh, I, would, I had to like scramble and I was sort of adapting as I was shooting. So some of them were not, but I was also shooting in a raw format, which is the camera captures just like as much data as possible. And I can go in and sort of create a fake version of multiple exposures when I'm editing 
so I can change the levels and then layer basically the same picture over top of each other, uh, but sort of paint it in afterwards when I'm editing the pictures. Great question. Where will your senior installation be? Yeah, it'll be in the Bolivar Art Gallery along with all the other digital media and design majors. And they said it's the biggest one yet. We have the most graduating seniors, so there'll be a lot of stuff there. Yeah, okay. Can I ask you a question about the sound? Mm -hmm. Um, but that sound, that kind of clicking image, white noise, has a kind of retro fear attached to it. Yeah. And I was just wondering, when you were out taking the photos, if you could have sampled other sounds, right, that could have helped to amplify the impact of those images, what, what might they have been? Yeah. So the question was, how might the use of sound have amplified the urban legends that you were capturing in your photographs? Yeah, I, when I, well, I originally thought of the projector idea, and my plan was to capture audio in the field as I was recording, but I didn't think it would be possible to actually get one of those projectors to use as the installation. Um, but I went to a store in Lexington, and I actually was able to find one. Um, so I was going to capture footage just of like footsteps as I walked around to sort of lean into the navigating the space. And a train came by almost every time, for example, at the bridge, and I was hoping to maybe capture audio of that coming by. Um, so I kind of veered away from the projection for a while until I was able to actually possibly pull it off. So if possible, I might try to actually go out and capture sound, but that was the original plan. Yeah. <laughs> Were you scared? <laughs> yeah, it was creepy. Uh, I only went to a couple of the places alone, but I was usually calling on the phone with Mary. And one time I brought my dad with me, and <laughs> I brought both of them, and they both kind of helped me feel a little bit less scared even. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was pretty creepy. <laughs> How, was, did the, uh, how did you hear about these urban legends? And I feel similarly, I've never heard of any of them before, and they were really interesting. It took like, a lot of searching, and it sort of started on a lot of like, like, sort of generic travel websites of like haunted Kentucky, just online, just like searching for Kentucky urban legends when I decided that I wanted to do this project. Um, and as I would sort of like, find one, I would start searching it more directly and trying to, I would just basically just search until I found those like really ugly looking websites that seemed like the most authentic, like they're not trying to get clicks, they're just people that are like weirdly interested in these really niche stories. And those are the ones where they had like the most interesting details and they'd have like a full page about each story. Um, yeah, that was how I found them. Um, oh, sorry. No, you're fine. <laughs> yes, in terms of the urban legend about the witches, where is the grave of the mother who was supposedly burned alongside her daughter? Uh, there was, like, her mother was also buried in that cemetery. There were several uh, of her family members buried near her, but she was not, she didn't have one of the fences, which I guess kind of pokes a hole in the story. But, um, yeah, when the research, when... There were people that were interested in uncovering the truth about this story. They found her death certificate, which revealed that she died of that stomach disease. Um, and her mother was alive like 20 years after the, she died. So it's not like they died at the same time even. It was just, yeah. So usually we have Linda Brethett present the award, but unfortunately she couldn't be here today. So. Yes, wake up, James. <laughs> uh, so Dr. Price, I'm going to invite you back up so that we can present Matthew with the special Breathit Award. Yes. All right. 
So each year we um, offer to students, which actually fits that you're so focused on Kentucky, <laughs> this engraved julep cup. So record, to give you a little bit, something that's not too big, you can throw mm -hmm. in a suitcase when you move to Denver. Uh, <laughs> you, can, you can take it with you to remember um, the fact that you were willing to stand up before this crowd <laughs> and present your original research based on um, what you have done here at the university and were, were rewarded for it. We thank you so much uh, for stepping out and, and doing this. Um, and we appreciate what you have shared with us today. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> and for all of the students who have not yet graduated, we want you to think about next year submitting your application so that you too can have this wonderful experience um, of presenting your original research. So thank you so much. Let's give Matthew another round of applause. Thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Thank you.